So uh, this afternoon we'll start with uh, a strengthening mechanism that's um, really very important in, uh, in, in, in many steels and um, it's grain size. Um, it's a, it's a um, structural uh, strengthening mechanism um, and, um, and we'll see it's very uh, efficient. Um, having said this, it's complex um, to understand how it really works. I mean, there are models. Uh, that's one thing. And second, um, there are limits to um, the usefulness of it. And uh, we'll actually talk about this um, in my introduction here. So, so um, again, uh, strengthening comes from putting obstacles in the way of dislocations. Um, a very good obstacle is to just um, end the, um, the glide plane on which the dislocations move. And the grain boundary, just, just because there is discontinuity in the lattice, just does just that. You know, it's a, and so it's a very strong bound. It's a very strong obstacle, very, very strong. Um, very difficult for the dislocation to um, uh, cross the boundary. And, uh, and it can happen, but the boundaries then need to have a very specific crystal st structure of themselves to allow for uh, the dislocations to actually cross the boundary. So, and that often involves dislocation reaction. So um, what we'll just think of uh, grain boundaries as uh, very strong obstacles. And we'll come back towards the end of this uh, section uh, about the importance of the misorientations between boundaries also in terms of how strong the, uh, uh, the strengthening is. Right, and uh, in um, undergraduate um, introductions to material science, you know uh, that uh, there is this effect of um, the uh, grain boundary strengthening is expressed through this hall batch relation where uh, originally um, the, the uh, one f uh, uh, so these these two uh, gentlemen hall and, and then independently from him patch uh, found that there was a relation uh, empirical relation yes between the the yield strength or the proof stress of uh, steels and the one over the square root of the uh, uh, grain size. And, uh, and you can see um, the data here that uh, this, this holds for uh, alpha iron, pure iron, and, and for austenitic steels at, at room temperature. And it's a nice linear relation very often. Um, so let's have a look at um, uh, within what bounds does this relation appear to hold. It appears to hold for steels uh, within a very wide range of grain sizes that we can technically achieve, yes. So if, if we plot here the, the stress, the yield stress of um, uh, low carbon steels in function of, as a function of 1 over D. Hmm? Uh, we see this linear relationship yeah? and um, at the um, large grain uh, limit uh, this uh, line would seem to end where it's supposed to end you know, close to the um, this, the, the yield strength for a single crystal. Hmm? 
So that is, uh, the grain is so large, grain boundaries don't have an effect, and basically the, the yield strength you measure is, is related to the single crystal properties. Alternatively, on the other side, um, when we have very tiny grains, uh, less than 10 nanometers, yes, very small, um, the, the value, you know, if we, if we continue the line, would end up close to the theoretical strength of, of iron, yes? Uh, which we uh, calculated somewhat earlier in the course to be about 8,000 megapascal. So it seems to hold for a wide range of grain sizes. We'll come back to that in a moment. And uh, the, the kind of grain sizes we deal with in, uh, for steels are in, in this area here, this, this, this kind of gray zone. You have uh, steels with very large grain sizes. Uh, those are electrical steels. They have very large grain sizes. Uh, sorry, grain-oriented electrical steels, I should say. Yeah. They're almost single crystal uh, materials from the point of view of uh, the hull patch uh, relation. And then on the other end, you have structural units that are smaller than microns uh, in decomposition products such as bainite or martensite. So these are very common, this is a very uh, uh, wide range of, of, of dimensions here. Okay. Okay. One of the um, applications uh, where uh, grain size controlled is uh, very much used are uh, the high strength low alloy steel grains. And they're very often, for some reason, presented as precipitation hardened steels. Actually, they are grain refined steels. The, if you compare the contribution of precipitation hardening to the contribution of grain size uh, hardening, um, the grain size effect is much larger. So where does this, uh, how do we in this case achieve very high, uh, uh, very small grain sizes, excuse me? That is by controlling the static recrystallization between two deformation passes during hot deformation. So this is uh, uh, represented here for a uh, hot rolling mill. Hot rolling mill operates at temperatures so that we deform the material in austenitic state. Yeah. And when uh, the material gets rolled in one pass, it will instantaneously recrystallize. Instantaneously meaning within less than a second. Hmm? Uh, so that means the recrystallization kinetics, static recrystallization, are very fast. Yes? And you will actually achieve grain growth yes, before you reach the second, the, 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 the next deformation uh, in the next uh, uh, roll stand, mill stand. When you add uh, an element, niobium, to this, you get a phenomenon that's called solute drag. And the solute drag suppresses the motion of the recrystallization front in the microstructure. And that, it doesn't uh, yeah, it, it, it suppresses it, it doesn't stop it 100%, it suppresses it, and it suppresses it long enough so that, so when you deform a grain in this uh, first stand here, so you pancake, you, we, we said you pancake the austenite grain, yes, the recrystallization rate, the static recrystallization rate is very much slower uh, due to the presence of this niobium, yes, so that um, the material is not recrystallized by the time you do a next deformation. Yes? So you, you have what's called 
accumulation of strain, yes, or pancaking of the austenite grain. And then when you do the transformation, the transformation is from deformed austenite, and the nucleation rate is very high. And as a consequence, you get very fine grain sizes. And there is also, during the transformation, precipitation of niobium carbide, and that, that gives you this additional precipitation hardening. But again, as I said, in these particular steels, it is a contribution that is not uh, as important as the contribution from the, uh, the grain size uh, reduction. So here you have uh, some data for, first of all, for carbon manganese constructional steels, as normal constructional steels. You have the yield strength as a function of the reciprocal um, of the grain size, uh, square root of the grain size. And you see that, uh, so those are the squares, you see a straight line, yes. And uh, pretty much uh, stops here at around a little less than 10 micron, yes. And that's basically all you can get. You, know, you, you cannot refine the grain size much more than 10 micron if you do not do anything special. The addition of niobium, you see, extends this domain to much lower values. You can go close to five microns, yes? Right, so you, you, what you basically, you extend the, the whole patch effect, right? To lower grain sizes. And you can also see that there is a slight increase, an additional increase in strength, and that slight additional increase in strength comes from the presence of the precipitates, okay? So strengthening effect um, by reducing grain size is very um, uh, common and, 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 and the clearest grade, steel grade, where this is, is uh, being done are, are niobium alloyed uh, steel grades. Uh, and they, not only sheet material, plate material, many grades are uh, niobium added to uh, obtain grain refining through what's called, what the process I've described a moment ago, thermomechanical uh, processing. All right, so, um, so that's wonderful. Um, we have methods to control the grain size, to make it smaller. We can go down to five microns. Um, so that's very good. So uh, we're all for grain size reduction. Yes? Right. So grain size reduction gives you strength, but it doesn't give you formability. So you all, when you uh, reduce grain sizes, you will always pay in terms of formability. And the best example of this is shown, is shown here. So for uh, ferritic steels and for austenitic steels here on the right, what you see is we plot the strain hardening coefficient hmm, uh, as a function of 1 over uh, the square root of uh, d, yes? And, and what we see is just the reverse as uh, we had for the, um, for the whole patch equation. The whole patch went like this. Yes, it, as a function of one over d, this goes like this. So that's, that means that um, as I reduce the grain size, so if it goes this way, I will get more strength, but I will get less strain hardening, okay? Of course, if I get less strain hardening, it means I get less elongation, uniform elongation that is. And you can see this on the, on the right here. This is, uh, in here you have, instead of the strain hardening coefficient, you have the elongation for austenitic steels as a function of one over the square root of d. And you see, uh, I reduce the grain size. I pay the price in terms of plastic plasticity, plastic deformation. And that's very general. By the way, it's not, uh, it's not specific to steels. Any material, uh, crystalline 
polycrystalline material, uh, you reduce the grain size, you, reduce it, you will lose plasticity. Right, and um, just a few words about uh, severe plastic deformation. Uh, there's been a big effort in the material science community to uh, achieve tremendous strengths in materials, uh, metals and alloys, by uh, reducing the grain size, by taking the hull patch equation to its extreme. Yes. Um, and, and so, uh, and there are many uh, uh, methods, uh, ECAP you've probably heard about, or accumulative roll bonding is another one of these methods. Uh, and you can, by plastic deformation, reduce the grain size tremendously. Hmm? So, for instance, the accumulative roll bonding, um, what you do is you, you, uh, you start with your material, in uh, yeah, so, so nicely recrystallized, uh, recrystallized ferrite grains. You, you roll this material, you, you, um, you heat it up a little bit, yeah? so you, you roll it, yes? so you, now you get unrecrystallized uh, ferrite. Hmm? You can see they're pancaked, yes? and uh, you do a reduction of 50%, so the, the, the plate is now twice as long, right? You, um, you clean it, so the oxides are gone, and then you cut it in half, yes? And you put this part on top of this one. So you basically uh, cut the material and stack it, yeah? Then you heat, heat this stack again. It looks exactly the same as your starting material, and you roll again. And you repeat the process. Um, and you always roll material that's as thick as the starting material, but you accumulate a huge amount of strain, yes? Huge amount of strain. And, uh, and, you, and you can obtain uh, grain sizes that are a few uh, less than 100 nanometers, yes? But what you see is precisely what I said uh, earlier, is um, when you do grain size refinement by severe plastic deformation, it leads to a collapse of plastic deformation ability. The material will have huge strengths, but no formability. Yeah? And that's definitely the case for single phase ferritic steels uh, when the grain size is less than one micron. Mm -hmm. So you can see here uh, the yield strength as a function of one over D, so that I should see my nice hull patch relation, that's okay. I see that for the tensile strength, I also have a hull patch relation, but it's flatter. The slope of this relation is less, yes? And so they meet at this point. When the yield strength and the tensile strength meet, that means there is not much deformation in between, right? And indeed, that's what you see. You see the total def uh, deformation decreases and the uniform de uh, uh, deformation uh, is reduced to zero. Yeah. So technically, we, we can make steels with five micron grain sizes. It is possible via, via this method to go to mi one micron or less. But there's not much point in going to one micron or less unless the material you make doesn't require any formability. So, um, so what's important here, for instance, is that the only remaining uh, amount of deformation here is post-uniform. So it's, it's after the yield point. And, and so you can see this is the elongation times 20. So you have here about 10% or less at best of deformation potential in your material. So if, you, um, if you're interested in having a material with some amount of 
uh, deformation possibilities in, in the application um, going uh, to very small grain sizes in single phase steels is not an option. So um, having said this, um, there are methods to uh, re uh, to, to, to have ultrafine materials, but you need multi-phase materials. Multi-phase materials um, with, um, that are specially designed to regain the, uh, to give you back their, uh, the plasticity. All right, so let's now um, have a closer look at this Hall patch equation. So the original equation is, is based on experimental observation, right? So this people just checked it and you know it looked like a straight line, so that's um, um, and it was originally f uh, designed for the yield strength, yes, of steels. Yeah. Turned out that uh, later on, one day we noticed that uh, there was also a Hall patch equation very similar to the uh, whole patch equation for yield strength, for flow stress. So any, any amount of strain um, was also somehow related to uh, one over the square root of uh, the uh, grain size. Now, you are so used to this, yes, from your undergraduate studies and talking about it, that, and many people repeat it all the time, yes, um, this inverse square root dependence is widely accepted. But there are many alternatives out there, yes? And um, there are people who don't believe this is actually um, correct, yes? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and, and so it's by no means conclusively and nicely theoretically established, yes? Uh, and in, you know, and you know, you can find in the literature that when you plot flow stress um, in general, yes, you can. It's one over d to some power n, yes. But that um, you know, you can have this n value between one third, 0.3, to one. So it's not. It's maybe not necessarily. Uh, one over the square root of d, yes? Because if you play around and you try other, uh, you know, particularly you try uh, a point 0.3 or you, you try uh, uh, point 0.6, yeah? Or, um, the difference is not that big. So um, we have to be careful uh, about this. Also important is the, um, uh, if you look at the uh, whole patch equation for the flow stress, yes? So what, what does that mean, the whole patch equation for the flow stress? So what, what you basically do is um, you, you, you have a flow stress for a certain grain size D1, yes? You have a flow curve, yeah? stress-strain curve, stress-strain curve. And um, the same material now, you have refined the grain, yes? And uh, you have another. So say this is the yield point, yeah? Yield strength, yeah. Um, so, so now we get, it's a finer grain, you get this, D2 and um, D3, yeah? And so, as I said, the original, no, oh, sorry, one, two, and yield strength, three, yes? The original uh, Hall patch equation was about these values, yes? The flow stress equation says that if you plot for any strain, specific strain, you plot the flow stress for this grain size, the flow stress for this grain size, flow stress for this, you will also find a Hall patch uh, like equation, yes? And so that is important because yes, you find uh, a similar 
relation between the flow stress and the uh, grain size for different strains, but the slope changes. Yes, you can see the slope is steeper at the, for the yield and it reduces, become the, 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 the curve now becomes flatter as I increase the strength. Yes, so the impact of the grain refinement is largest at low strains, right? And you can see that sigma zero, so the, the, two, cons the two constants, are very, people very often call them constants, sigma zero and the whole patch slope, kf, yes, they're actually not constants. They are strain dependent parameters, yes? And in general, and you can very, uh, see this from here, uh, sigma zero will increase with the uh, deformation, whereas, so you can see this, the, the curves could become uh, flatter, yes? The k value decreases, all right? So important message here, these parameters are not constants. So when you use them, Yes, uh, to do strength calculations, yes, be very careful what you're using. Yes, is your are you um, um, using this equation to calculate the effect of the grain size on the yield strength? Yes, or on the flow strength? Okay, good. So these are just um, a few words of caution. How? But there's something more uh, profound to this equation, yes? And that is when we uh, were first exposed to a whole patch equation, we, um, we said, you know, we talk about the grain size. The material has a grain size. Uh, but what you know, if we think very um, a little bit, not even deeply about grain size, you know, it's actually difficult to say what is it that people say is the grain size of a material. Hmm? Okay, so and so let's let's just have a look at this. Hmm? So there are experimental difficulties or theoretical difficulties because we, we we like to assign a grain size to a material, yeah. a single grain size. Yeah. So first of all, there's no single grain size. You take any material, yes. You take any material, and um, you can. And we'll see some of these methods. You can measure the grain size of individual grains, yes, you will never find one single value. You will find a distribution. Yes. And this distribution may be um, a broad or um, sharp, but it's always going to be a distribution. For instance, this is for a uh, iron, uh, alpha iron, annealed at uh, 650 for 25 minutes and 625 minutes, so the distribution, that is the, so the frequency of certain grain sizes, and this is presented in such a way that uh, it's, it's normalized to the mean diameter of the grains, yeah, you can see there is a, uh, a distribution. Yeah? And, uh, yes, and this distribution, the peak of the distribution here is lower than, so if, if I uh, calculate, if I look at the mean value, right, that's number one here, you can see that uh, the, uh, the peak is not equal to, the peak value of the, yeah, is not the same as the uh, mean value of the grain size. Huh? All right, so, uh, so obviously, uh, there's a problem here, yes, about uh, when we use uh, the grain size, we automatically assume that uh, this distribution can be described by one single 
number, hmm? whereas it's a distribution. Uh, second, uh, grains are three-dimensional things and not two-dimensional things. So um, we, when we analyze grain sizes of materials, of steels, we make assumptions about the three-dimensional shape of these grains. Huh? Um, so when we do, and, and you know that if you've ever done this, if you, you do a standard metallographic uh, technique, you, you can have the distribution in, of uh, the size of the grains in two-dimensional, a two-dimensional section, yes? So if you want to have a true um, feeling for what is the, di the size, the 3D size of the, the grain, yeah? you, you have to make assumptions about the grain shape or you, base, or you have to go into a full 3D analysis of, of your microstructure. So, okay? so uh, well, let's have a look at the number of possibilities that are, uh, are uh, being used. Hmm? So one of the uh, most commonly used method to determine grain size is what we call the linear intercept method. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and what you do is you, you make an assumption, first of all, you make an assumption that the grain size is related to L. And L is the intercept distance across a grain measured on the micrograph of the microstructure taken at a certain magnification, M. Mm -hmm. And so we measured the number of intercepts Yes, between a straight line of length L prime drawn on this micrograph, yes. Uh, and this, so the, the intercepts between this, this line and the grain boundaries, hmm? and the average linear intercept length is then given by the, uh, the, the, uh, the length of that line, yes. Uh, divided by the magnification, divided by the number of intercepts. So uh, this, this is how you do it, basically. Uh, you, you just make a line through this micrograph. Uh, you measure the intercepts with the grains, yes? And you count the number of grains you have encountered, yes? So here I, I have encountered uh, 10 grains, and I've also encountered a grain partially and on both ends, yes? So I count these for a half. So in total I have 11 grains, and I've, I know that uh, with taking my magnification into account that this length is one millimeter, so the grain size is uh, uh, 91 microns. Excuse me, the mean linear intercept for this particular line is 91 microns, yes? Okay, right, and, and so that's, that's uh, steel grain sizes, typical um, constructional steels, grain sizes go from, as I said, around 10 microns to 20 microns. So that's a pretty coarse grain, and um, I can tell you why that is a pretty coarse grain. It's a, hot rolled material that was annealed, and it's a ferritic stainless steel, so it didn't go through phase transformation, so you get big grains, big grains, yes. Um, and so, good. But now this, this is not really a grain size, a linear intercept. This linear intercepts of 91, it's not really a grain size, it's just a linear intercept. So now I'm going to make a step, yes? I'm going to assume that the grains are, they, they don't look anything like spherical, but I'm just going to assume that they're spherical, yeah? And then there is a simple, and the reason why we do this is because there is a simple stereological relation yeah, between this, this length, this average length, and the grain diameter, yes? So it takes into account the stereologic that if I make a, um, a random cut through these grains, uh, and, and some cuts may be very 
uh, may be close to the pole of this grain, others may be through the uh, equator of that grain, yes? Uh, so this equation takes care of this. Hmm? And it says the relation between the mean intercept length and an equivalent three-dimensional spherical grain is, uh, uh, so the, the grain diameter is 1.5 times the uh, mean uh, intercept length. And so if I measure a 91, 91 value, 91 micron for mean intercept length, the grain size is larger. Hmm? It's actually 137 micron. Okay? So that's a method that's very often used. However, um, you can ask yourself uh, whether the choosing a circular, a, a, you know, a, a spherical a grain is such a good idea. You know? uh, in particular, because you, you feel, I mean, it's not, not difficult to understand, if you have spherical grains, there's going to be lots of spaces in the, in the solid, yes, that will be empty. Yeah? And um, so, so you can use other s grains that are not uh, uh, that are all the same in shape, but they're not spherical, yes? And one of the ways that uh, we like to do this in material science, yes, uh, is by using a 14-sided polyhedra, yes? Which goes by this word, tetrachaidecahedral shape, yes? Um, and it's shown here, you have two of these uh, uh, polyhedra uh, next to each other. Um, they, uh, they will, you can fill space with that, there will be no empty volume, yes? Um, and um, uh, so you have uh, uh, flat interfaces. And on top of that, the amount of interface we have is minimal. Yes? Because you could have used, instead of these um, polyhedra, you could have used cubes, right? Yes? But then the amount of grains surface boundaries would not have been minimal. Yes? So this is one of the reasons why we kind of like this, this polyhedra. Yes? It fills space and it also minimizes the amount of interface, right? In this case, there is a relation between, uh, you know, again, if I, if I would make a cut, two-dimensional, uh, a random cut through this a structure that looks like this, yes, um, I would find that the, the, the equivalent diameter, you know, if I replace this uh, polyhedra with, with a, um, um, uh, a spherical um, volume, I would find 1.68 times the um, uh, mean intercept length. So not 1.5, but 1.68. So I would have a grain size that would be slightly larger than the one I would get with by applying the uh, standard uh, uh, linear intercept method. Okay. All right, but there's nothing that prevents us from doing other things, yes? Uh, why do we measure um, linear intercepts? Why don't we measure surfaces instead, yes? We could have measure, we can measure surfaces, right? And so, um, and, and so there are um, alternative methods where we use surfaces. Hmm? So, you use a circular line to compute a grain area. That's another approach to grain size measurements where you say, what is the number of grains per area? Yes, and we'll, we'll, in a moment we'll see how we do this in engineering, yes? And that's actually 
in the standard ASTM methods of measuring grain size, that's actually what we measure. We don't measure grain size, we measure the number of grains per surface area, yes? But we can also, from this approach, making assumptions about the shape of the grain, that 3D shape of the grain, uh, uh, get, an, uh, get a value for the grain size, okay? So say, say for instance here, um, uh, you, know, you have a circle with a, a diameter of about um, uh, eight centimeters, yes, 5,000 millimeters in area. In area is drawn on a micrograph, yes, uh, taken at certain magnification. Uh, these numbers are, um, I, I, I put numbers here, I, I, I didn't have to, uh, it's just for the example here for this formula, yeah. Um, and, and, and I have a, a microstructure uh, taken at a magnification M. And so, and I count the number of grains inside this sphere, yes? So this is a one, this is two, three, four, five, six, yes? And I also count the number of grains which intersect the circle. So this grain here, which is like a little bit inside the circle, I count also, but not as one grain as a half a grain, just like I did for the linear intercept method, okay? Right, and then I, I, uh, I um, count the number of grains per square, per surface square, right? Uh, is square root of the magnification divided by 5,000, that is the, uh, the area, uh, times N1 plus N2 divided by two. N1 is the, the number of grains inside, N2 is the number of grains we intersect. So I can compute the average grain area, yes? Hmm? Uh, uh, grain area uh, for one uh, square uh, millimeter, right? So I have grain area in square millimeter is one over Na. So I have Na, one over Na um, is the, uh, the area of a grain, yeah? And then I can compute something that is called the equivalent circle diameter. Hmm? So there I, I basically assume that the, the area, yeah, this, this area I've determined, yes, is equal to pi times uh, equivalent circle diameter divided by two square. Hmm? So I basically say the surface I've measured, it may not be circular, but I'll assume it's circular, yes? And I, and I will determine the equivalent diameter, yes? And so this equivalent diameter is equal to the square root four times A, yes, divided by pi, okay? Right, and now, uh, so I assume that these grains are spherical, and then I have, a, a, there exists a st simple stereological relation between the intercept area and the grain diameter. Yes, and so, so if you, so you combine these two equations between um, uh, that, that we have here, we find that D yes, is 1.224 times the equivalent circle diameter. So, right, so it's, you, it's not 1.5, it's not 1.6, it's 1.224, right? So, Depending, what I want to illustrate is depending on which way you've decided to determine what D is in your Hall-Patch equation, you may get different, slightly different answers, yes? Now, um, if I, my information is right, uh, this is the way uh, EBSD programs calculate grain sizes using the equivalent circle diameter, okay? Okay. As I said, in uh, the uh, standards in engineering, grain sizes are computed all the time because it's a uh, for, for production purposes, it's very important to have an idea 
of the grain size and of steels, for instance, yes, and to track the grain size. Hmm? Because if you suddenly have um, uh, the, the way uh, the grain size is controlled in steels is by having precipitates in the microstructure. These precipitates pin the grains and prevent grain growth yes, uh, during annealing, for instance. Yes? If the precipitation is incorrect, yes, and you get grain growth locally or at, and over large areas, yes, um, it basically means that your mechanical properties will collapse, yes, locally or on big areas, yes, and you may find yourself with major troubles uh, because of that. So for certain uh, grades of steels and certain applications, uh, grain sizes are constantly monitored, yes, by automatic systems, yeah? automated systems. And, uh, and in the steel industry, um, we use what's called a grain size number. We, we actually do not use grain diameters. Yeah? We use grain size numbers. And it's a little bit confusing because it's, it's not a grain size. Yes? It is a measure of the number of grains per surface area. Yes? So, number of grains per surface area. Yeah? So, if I have a surface area, yes, and I have many grains, yes, yes, or I have a surface area with only four grains, the grain size here will be high, yes, and here the grain size will be small, yes. But if I'm talking about the number of grains per surface area, G, where will G be large? G will be large here, yes, and G will be small here. So it's the opposite of grain size, right? So when people give you a large G number or grain size number, Yes, it means that the grain size is small. And, and then, you know, give you a small uh, number, that means the grain size is large, right? So it's a little bit confusing, um, but uh, again, it's another approach of, of measuring uh, grain size. Um, and it's a quality uh, tool. It's not, it's, you don't measure grain size in this industry to check if the whole patch equation applies, right? You just want to make sure that nothing is happening to your grain size yeah. uh, because it impacts the strength. So, um, so we have a scale. Uh, it's originally ASTM scale. Uh, it's widely uh, uh, used. Mm -hmm. And it's calculated on base of N, which is the number of grains per square inch on a micrograph taken at magnification 100. So it's a little bit, um, uh, it's very specific. Hmm? Um, it's also a little bit bothersome because it's in square inch that the, um, the number of grains is measured. We have an international standard organization cor uh, uh, corresponding uh, grain size numbers, which is called G-ISO. And there, it's, uh, we use the number of grains per square millimeters on the micrograph of magnification uh, one. Yeah? So um, th there's, a, there's a simple relation between the ASTM, uh, the ISO, which is, and, and this relation is shown here. So it's, it's uh, not a big difference, actually. Uh, but uh, so ASTM, so if you, if you have measured the A, uh, the 
so the number of um, grains per square uh, inch at the magnification of 100, uh, you can compute the G value, G A S T M, grain size number according to A S T M, um, simply using this formula. So, um, so you get basically a table A S T M going from one to uh, 10 and, and beyond, you can go beyond here of course. The grain area, yes, is of course at uh, small numbers, yeah? uh, small numbers means large grains, yes. You have, uh, uh, this is the, um, the size here, this seems to be wrong here, grain, grain. oh yeah, this, uh, if you have the slides, it changes into millimeters, it's, it's, uh, uh, millimeters, yes. And so, um, right, and, and, and the grain area at 10 is uh, 100 and, um, did I say uh, millimeters? Um, I want to correct this, it's microns. Okay, so this is micron square and this is microns, not millimeters of course. Okay, so this is 250 microns. Very bothersome from uh, Microsoft. They always want to correct things like this. Um, okay, so large grains, low G values, small grains, large G values. Okay, let's see uh, how we play with this. Let's say uh, we have a, a average grain diameter in niobium HSLA steel, and we're told that the ESTM grain size number is 10, yes? Uh, so what's the, what's the grain size? You know, if I want to change this into grain size, grain size number is converted to grain density per square inch, yes? So we, we first uh, change the 10 into uh, 512 grains per square inch, yes? That's what we see at the magnification of 100. Um, the grain, so this is for magnification at 100, right? So if I correct and bring it back to the, the real magnification, right? And as a one, a by one, a one, one time magnification, no magnification in other words, grain density per square inch is uh, 512 times 100 times 100, yes? To the fourth. And I by using the relation between inches and millimeters, I can calculate that I have close to 8,000 grains per square millimeter. Hmm. The surface area of the grain can be computed, yes. The mean surface grain diameter can be computed, yes, if I have the, the surface area of the, um, uh, the grain, and I find 7.14 uh, uh, is the size, yes? But if I assume a spherical grain, yes, the mean three-dimensional grain size is to, I have to multiply this 1.5, yes? Because this, this value is a two-dimensional, uh, two-dimensional uh, measurement, okay? So anything I get in two dimensions, I will have to correct for what it would be if it was three-dimensional, right? So that's, that's why we do this last step here. Yeah? And so we find uh, 11 micron, okay? And that's uh, nicely uh, what it should be, okay? 10 should be 11, okay? So 10 here is 11, all right? All right, good. Right, so now we are... Um, uh, wondering uh, how come we have this uh, relation, this whole patch relation, um, and uh, is there any way in which we can theoretically derive it? Yes. Uh, well, there are two, there are two main m models, if you want, or types of models. There are many, you know, many people have, you know, um, been. Um, uh, very creative as to uh, uh, generating theories for the uh, 
uh, whole patch equation. Hmm? And in general, what you see is that you have theories that are based on what we call dislocation pileup models. And then we have uh, uh, theories that uh, are based on work hardening models. So the dislocation pileup model, that's the one that's uh, you know, commonly uh, presented, yes, uh, works like this. Hmm? You form dislocation pileups at grain boundaries. Hmm? And the, uh, this results in a local stress concentration, which makes it possible for plastic deformation to propagate through the grain boundary. Yes? So the, the pileups will make it possible to have the grain boundary crossed by the slip hmm? without having actual dislocations cross the, uh, the boundary. Hmm? And, uh, and there are different mechanisms. Uh, some people say, well, the pileups can just burst through the grain boundary somewhere or another. Yeah? And other people say, well, the, uh, the pileups generate stress razors, points where the, the stress is raised, and that will force um, dislocation sources to be activated in adjacent boundary, uh, grain boundary, uh, grains, excuse me. And so that will, uh, that's the mechanism. Hmm? The, the good thing is that all these theories uh, find the same answer. One, it's all proportional to one over the square root of the um, grain size for the yield strength and the, and the flow stress. Hmm? So uh, the, the, the big controlling factor here is basically the stress required to generate dislocations or to activate frank resources. Okay? And so it's, it's, it's uh, the stress required to generate dislocation is uh, generated by the dislocation pileups at the boundaries. So let, let me just illustrate what I said with a, a drawing here, a schematic. So in the center here, we have, for instance, a Frank Reed source that generates dislocations uh, in my dislocation loops in my uh, ferrite grain, for instance, yes? And these dislocations, they're all the same dislocations, all they have the same Burgers factor, yes? And they all run on the same glide plane into this grain boundary. So this pile up, yes, this dislocation will have a, will push this location number two and this location number n back. Yes? So you will generate a back stress on your source, on the dislocation source. And so you have two things is that uh, first of all, the presence of this dislocation pileup stops the, the source from creating more uh, 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 dislocations. And the other thing is that because you have this pileup, you get a, um, a magnifying of the applied stress. Okay? And so two things can happen according to some people, this dislocation pileup can burst through the grain boundary. According to others, the uh, uh, increased, the magnified uh, uh, stresses that are caused by this pileup, yes, will in this adjacent grain gener uh, uh, cause a Frank Reed source to generate dislocations, for instance, by the mechanism of double cross slip that, that we know. Okay, let's, let's take just a five minute break here and um,